Friday, April 1st, 4.51 p.m. I'm going to read Liber Semec, Theurgia Goetia Summa Congressus Cum Daimone Sub Figura 800. Latin, the highest Goetic Theurgy, and Congressus with the Daimon. Being the ritual employed by the beast 666 for the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of his holy guardian angel, during the semester of his performance of the operation of the sacred magic of Abramel and the mage. For the text of this invocation, as it first appeared, see Crowley the Goetia, 1904. Prepared in Anno 17, Sol in Six Degrees Virgo, at the Abbey of Thelema in Cephalodium, by the beast sits at six in service to Frater Progradior. Official publication of AA, Class D for the grade of Adeptus Minor. Point two, Ars Congressus cum Daimone, Latin, the art of Congress with the Daimon. Let the Adeptus Minor be standing in his circle of the square of Tifereth, armed with his wand and cup, but let him perform the ritual throughout in his body of light. He may be prepared by Liber 175, the reading of Liber 65, and by the practices of yoga. He may invoke Hadith by wine and strange drugs if he so will. Any such formula should be used only when the adept has full knowledge based on experience of the management of such matters. He prepares the circle by the usual formulae of banishing and consecration, etc. He recites Section A as a rehearsal before his holy guardian angel of the attributes of that angel. Each phrase must be realized with full concentration of force, so as to make samadhi as perfectly as possible upon the truth proclaimed. Line 1. He identifies his angel with the Ain Sof and the Kether thereof, one formulation of Hadith in the boundless body of Nuit. Line 2, 3, and 4. He asserts that his angel has created for the purpose of self-realization through projection and conditioned form three pairs of opposites, a the fixed and the volatile, b the unmanifest and the manifest, and c the unmoved and the moved, otherwise the negative and the positive in respect of matter, mind, and motion. Line 5. He acclaims his angel is himself made perfect, adding that this individuality is inscrutable and inviolable. In the neophyte ritual of the Golden Dawn, the Aerophant is the perfected Osiris, who brings the candidate, the natural Osiris, to identify with himself. But in the new Aeon, the Aerophant is Horus, therefore the candidate will be Horus too. Liber Ael, chapter 1, verse 49. What then is the formula of the initiation of Horus? It will no longer be that of the man through death, it will be the natural growth of the child. His experiences will no more be regarded as catastrophic. Their hieroglyph is the fool, the innocent and impotent Harpocrates babe becomes the Horus adult by obtaining the wand. Der Rain Thor, German the pure fool, Wagner's Parsifal, seizes the sacred lance. Bacchus becomes Pan. The holy guardian angel is the unconscious creature self, the spiritual phallus. His knowledge and conversation contributes occult puberty. It is therefore advisable to replace the name Asar Un Nefer by that of Rahur Kuwait at the outset and by that of one's own holy guardian angel when it has been communicated. Line 6. He hails him as Bez, the matter that destroys and devours Godhead, for the purpose of the incarnation of any god. Line 7. He hails him as Apophras, the motion that destroys and devours Godhead, for the purpose of the incarnation of any god. The combined action of these two devils is to allow the god upon whom they pray to enter into enjoyment and existence through the sacrament of individual life, bread, the flesh of Bez, and love, wine, the blood or venom of Apophras. Line 8. He acclaims his angel as having eaten of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, otherwise having become wise in the dyad Chakma, to apprehend the formula of equilibrium which is now his own, being able to apply himself accurately to his self-appointed environment. Line 9. He acclaims his angel as having laid down the law of love as the magical formula of the universe, that he may resolve the phenomenal again into its noumenal phase by uniting any two opposites in its static passion. Line 10. He acclaims his angel as having appointed that this formula of love should not affect only the dissolution of the separateness of the lovers into his own impersonal godhead, but their coordination in a child quintessentialized from its parents to constitute a higher order of being than theirs, so that each generation is an alchemical progress towards perfection in the direction of successive complexities, as line 9 asserts involution, line 10 asserts evolution. Line 11. 
he claims his angel as having devised this method of self-realization. The object of incarnation is to obtain articulate apprehension of the soul by measuring its reactions to its relations with other incarnated beings, and to observe theirs with each other. Section AA. Line 1. The adept asserts his right to enter into conscious communication with his angel, on the ground that the angel has himself taught him the secret magic by which he may make the proper link. Moshe is Memhe, the formation, and Yachida, Chia, Neshima, Ruach, the Sephiroth from Kether to Yasad, since 45 is the sum of 1 through 9, while Shin 300 is the sum of 1 through 24, which superadds to these 9 an extra 15 numbers. 45 is, moreover, Aleph, Daleth, Mem, Adam, Man. Moshe, or Moses, is thus the name of man as a God-concealing form. But in the ritual, let the adept replace this Moshe by his own motto as Adeptus Minor. For Israel, let him prefer his own magical race, according to the obligations of his oaths to our order. The beast, sits it six himself, used Ankaf Nakansu and Kem in this section. Line 2. The adept reminds his angel that he has created that one substance of which Hermes hath written in the Table of Emerald, whose virtue is to unite in itself all opposite modes of being, thereby to serve as a talisman charged with the spiritual energy of existence, an elixir or stone composed of the physical basis of life. This commemoration is placed between the two personal appeals to the angel, as if to claim privilege to partake of this Eucharist, which createth, sustaineth, and redeemeth all things. Line 3. He now asserts that he is himself the angel, or messenger of his angel, that is, that he is a mind and body whose office is to receive and transmit the word of his angel. He hails his angel not only as un nefer, the perfection of Asar himself as a man, but as Ta Apophras Ra, the identity Hadith wrapped in the dragon Nuit, and thereby manifested as a son Rahur Kui. The egg, or heart, girt with a serpent, is a cognate symbol. The idea is thus expressed later in the ritual. Section B. The adept passes from contemplation to action in the sections now following B to G G. He is to travel astrally around the circle, making the appropriate pentagram, sigils, and signs. His direction is Widdershins. He thus makes three curves, each covering three-fourths of the circle. He should give the sign of the enterer on passing the Qibla, or direction of Boleskin. This picks up the force naturally radiating from that point, and projects it in the direction of the path of the magician. This is an assumption based on Liber Legis, chapter 2, verse 78, and chapter 3, verse 34. The sigils are those given in the equinox, plate 10, outside the square. In these invocations, he should expand his girth and his stature to the utmost, assuming the form and the consciousness of the elemental god of the quarter. After this, he begins to vibrate the barbarous names of the ritual. Now let him not only fill his whole being to the uttermost with the force of the names, but let him formulate his will understood thoroughly as the dynamic aspect of his creative self, in an appearance symbolically apt, I say not in the form of a ray of light, of a fiery sword, or of aught save that bodily vehicle of the Holy Ghost which is sacred to Baphomet, by its virtue that concealeth the lion and the serpent, that his image may appear adorably upon the earth forever. Let then the adept extend his will beyond the circle in his imagined shape, and let it radiate with the light proper to the element invoked and let each word issue along the shaft with passionate impulse, as if its voice gave command thereto that it should thrust itself leapingly forward. Let also each word accumulate authority, so that the head of the shaft may plunge twice as far for the second word as for the first, and four times for the third as the second, and thus to the end. Moreover, let the adept fling forth his whole consciousness thither. Then at the final word let him bring rushing back his will within himself, steadily streaming and let him offer himself to this point, as Artemis to Pan, that this perfectly pure concentration of the elemental purge him thoroughly and possess him with its passion. In this sacrament being wholly at one with that element, let the adept utter the charge, hear me and make me, etc., with strong sense that this unity with that quarter of the universe confers upon him with the fullest freedom and privilege appertenant thereto. Let the adept take note of the wording of the charge, the firmament is the Ruach, the mental plane. It is the realm of Shu or Zeus, where revolves the wheel of the Gunas, the three forms of being. They correspond to sulfur, mercury, and salt of alchemy, to sattva, rajas, and tamas in the Hindu system, 
and are rather modes of action than actual qualities, even when conceived as latent. They are the apparatus of communication between the planes. As such, they are conventions. There is no absolute validity in any means of mental apprehension, but unless we make these spirits of the firmament subject unto us by establishing right relations within the possible limits with the universe, we shall fall into error when we develop our new instrument of direct understanding. It is vital that the adept should train his intellectual faculties to tell him the truth in the measure of their capacity. To despise the mind on account of its limitations is the most disastrous blunder. It is the common cause of the calamities which strew so many shores with the wreckage of the mystic armada. Bigotry, arrogance, bewilderment, all forms of mental and moral disorder, so often observed in people of great spiritual attainment, have brought the path itself into discredit. Almost all such catastrophes are due to trying to rebuild the temple of spirit without proper attention to the mental laws of structure and the physical necessities of foundation. The mind must be brought to its utmost pitch of perfection, but according to its own internal properties. One cannot feed a microscope on mutton chops. It must be regarded as a mechanical instrument of knowledge independent of the personality of its possessor. One must treat it exactly as one treats one's electroscope or one's eyes. One must guard against the danger of disturbance due to the influence of one's wishes. A physician calls in a colleague to attend to his own family, knowing that personal anxiety may derange his judgment. A microscopist who trusts his eyes when his pet theory is at stake may falsify the facts and find too late that he has made a fool of himself. In the case of initiation itself, history is scarred with the wounds inflicted by this dagger. It reminds us constantly of the dagger of relying upon the intellectual faculties. A judge must know the law in every point, and be detached from personal prejudices, and incorruptible or iniquity will triumph. Dogma, with persecution, delusion, paralysis of progress, and many another evil as its satraps, has always established a tyranny when genius has proclaimed it. Islam, making a bonfire of written wisdom, and Haeckel forging biological evidence, physicists ignorant of radioactivity disputing the conclusions of geology, and theologians impatient of truth struggling against the tide of thought, all such must perish at the hands of their own error in making their minds, internally defective or externally deflected, the measure of the universe. The ether is the akasha, the spirit, the ether of physics, which is the framework on which all forms are founded. It receives, records, and transmits all impulses without itself suffering mutation thereby. The earth is the sphere wherein the operation of these fundamental and etheric forces appears to perception. Under the earth is the world of those phenomena which inform those perceived projections and determine their particular character. Dry land is the place of dead, material things, dry, i.e. unknowable because unable to act on our minds. Water is the vehicle whereby we feel such things. Air, their menstruum, wherein these feelings are mentally apprehended. It is called whirling because of the instability of thought and the fatuity of reason on which we are yet dependent for what we call life. Rushing fire is the world in which wandering thought burns up the swift darting will. These four stages explain how the non-ego is transmitted into the ego. A spell of God is any form of consciousness and a scourge any form of action. The charge as a whole demands for the adept to control every detail of the universe which his angel is created as a means of manifesting himself to himself. It covers command of the primary projection of the possible in individuality in the antithetical artifice which is the device of mind, and in a balanced triplicity of modes or states of being whose combinations constitute the characteristics of cosmos. It is included also a standard of structure, a rigidity to make reference possible. Upon these foundations of condition, which are not things in themselves but the canon or code to which things conform, is builded the temple of being, whose materials are themselves perfectly mysterious, inscrutable as the soul, and like the soul imagining themselves by symbols which we may feel, perceive, and adapt to our use without ever knowing the whole truth about them. The adept sums up all these items by claiming authority over every form of expression possible to existence, whether it be a spell, idea, or a scourge act of the god that is of himself. The adept must accept every spirit, every spell, every scourge as part of his environment, and make them all subject to himself, 
that is, consider them as contributory causes of himself. They have made him what he is. They correspond exactly to his own faculties. They are all ultimately of equal importance. The fact that he is what he is proves that each item is equilibrated. The impact of each new impression affects the entire system in due measure. He must therefore realize that every event is subject to him. It occurs because he had need of it. Iron rusts because the molecules demand oxygen for the satisfaction of their tendencies. They do not crave hydrogen, therefore combination with that gas is an event which does not happen. All experiences contribute to make us complete in ourselves. We feel ourselves subject to them so long as we fail to recognize this. When we do, we perceive that they are subject to us. And whenever we strive to evade an experience, whatever it may be, we thereby do wrong to ourselves. We thwart our own tendencies. To live is to change, and to oppose change is to revolt against the law which we have enacted to govern our lives. To resent destiny is thus to abdicate our sovereignty, and to invoke death. Indeed, we have decreed the doom of death for every breach of the law of life, and every failure to incorporate any impression starves the particular faculty which stood in need of it. This section B invokes air in the east with a shaft of golden glory. Section C. The adept now invokes fire in the south. Flame red are the rays that burst from his verendum. Latin literally, thing to be revered, or awesome thing, sometimes indicating sex organs. It also has the sense of wand. Section D. He invokes water in the west, his wand billowing forth blue radiance. Section E. He goes to the north to invoke earth. Flowers of green flame flash from his weapon. As practice makes the adept perfect in his work, it becomes automatic to attach all these complicated ideas and intentions to their correlated works and acts. When this is attained, he may go deeper into the formula by amplifying its correspondences. Thus, he may invoke water in the manner of water, extending his will with majestic and irresistible motion, mindful of its impulse gravitation, yet with a suave and tranquil appearance of weakness. Again, he may apply the formula of water to its peculiar purpose as it surges back into its sphere, using it with conscious skill for the cleansing and calming of the receptive and emotional elements in his character, and for the solution or sweeping away of those tangled weeds of prejudice which hamper him from freedom to act as he will. Similar applications of the remaining invocations will occur to the adept who is ready to use them. Section F. The adept now returns to the Tifreth square of his Tau, and invokes spirit facing toward Valeskin by the active pentagrams, the sigil called the Mark of the Beast, and the signs of Lux. He then vibrates the names, extending his will in the same way as before, but vertically upward. At the same time, he expands the source of that will, the secret symbol of self, both about him and below, as if to affirm that self, duplex as its form, reluctant to acquiesce in its failure to coincide with the sphere of Nuit. Let him now imagine at the last word that the head of his will, where his consciousness is fixed, opens its fissure, the Brahmarandra chakra, at the juncture of the cranial sutures, and exudes a drop of clear crystalline dew, and that this pearl is his soul, a virgin offering to his angel, pressed forth from his being by the intensity of his aspiration. Section FF. With these words, the adept does not withdraw his will within him as in previous sections. He thinks of them as a reflection of truth on the surface of the dew, where his soul hides trembling. He takes them to be the first formulation in his consciousness of the nature of his holy guardian angel. Line 1. The gods include all the conscious elements of his nature. Line 2. The universe includes all possible phenomena of which he can be aware. Line 3. The winds are his thoughts, which have prevented him from attaining to his angel. Line 4. His angel has made voice, the magical weapon which produces words, and these words have been the wisdom by which he hath created all things. This voice is necessary as the link between the adept and his angel. The angel is king, the one who can, the source of authority and the fount of honor. Also the king or king's son who delivers the enchanted princess and makes her his queen. He is ruler, the unconscious will, to be thwarted no more by the ignorant and capricious false will of the conscious man. And he is helper, the author of the infallible impulse which sends the soul sweeping along the skies on its proper path with such impetus that the attraction of alien orbs is no longer sufficient to swerve it. 
the hear me clause is now uttered by the normal human consciousness, withdrawn to the physical body, the adept must deliberately abandon his attainment, because it is not yet his whole being which burns up before the beloved. Section G. The adept, though withdrawn, should have maintained the extension of his symbol. He now repeats the signs as before, save that he mates the passive invoking pentagram of spirit. He concentrates his consciousness within his twin symbol of self, and endeavors to send it to sleep. But if the operation be performed properly, his angel shall have accepted the offering of dew, and seized with fervor upon the extended symbol of will towards himself. This then shall he shake vehemently with vibrations of love reverberating with the words of the section. Even in the physical ears of the adept there shall resound an echo thereof, yet he shall not be able to describe it. It shall seem both louder than thunder and softer than the whisper of the night wand. It shall at once be inarticulate and mean more than he hath ever heard. Now let him strive with all the strength of his soul to withstand the will of his angel, concealing himself in the closet cell of the citadel of consciousness. Let him consecrate himself to resist the assault of the voice and the vibration until his consciousness faint away into nothing. For if there abide unabsorbed even one single atom of the false ego, that atom should stain the virginity of the true self and profane the oath. Then that atom should be so inflamed by the approach of the angel that it should overwhelm the rest of the mind, tyrannize over it, and become an insane despot to the total ruin of the realm. But all being dead to sense, who then is able to strive against the angel? He shall intensify the stress of his spirit so that his loyal legions of lion serpents leap from the ambush, awakening the adept to witness their will and sweep him with them in their enthusiasm, so that he consciously partakes their purpose and sees in its simplicity the solution of all his perplexities. Thus then shall the adept be aware that he is being swept away through the column of his will symbol, and that his angel is indeed himself, with intimacy so intense as become identity, and not that in a single ego, but in every unconscious element that shares in that manifold uprush. This rapture is accompanied by a tempest of brilliant light almost always, and also in many cases by an outburst of sound, stupendous and sublime in all cases, though its character may vary within wide limits. These phenomena are not wholly subjective. They may be perceived, though often under other forms, by even the ordinary man. The spate of stars shoot from the head of the will symbol, and is scattered over the sky in glittering galaxies. This dispersion destroys the concentration of the adept, whose mind cannot master such multiplicity of majesty. As a rule, he simply sinks, stunned into normality, to recall nothing of his experience but a vague, though vivid, impression of complete release and ineffable rapture. Repetition fortifies him to realize the nature of his attainment, and his angel, the link once made, frequents him, and trains him subtly to be sensitive to his holy presence and persuasion. But it may occur, especially after repeated success, that the adept is not flung back into his mortality by the explosion of the star spate, but identified with one particular lion serpent, continuing conscious thereof until it finds its proper place in space, when its secret self flowers forth as a truth, which the adept may then take back to earth with him. This is but a side issue, the main purpose of the ritual is to establish the relation of the subconscious self with the angel in such a way that the adept is aware that his angel is the unity which expresses the sum of the elements of that self, that his normal consciousness contains alien enemies introduced by the accidents of environment, and that this knowledge and conversation of his holy guardian angel destroys all doubts and delusions, confers all blessings, teaches all truth, and contains all delights. But it is important that the adept should not rest in mere inexpressible realization of this rapture, but rouse himself to make the relation submit to analysis, to render it in rational terms, and thereby enlighten his mind and heart in a sense as superior to fanatical enthusiasm as Beethoven's music is to West African war drums. Section GG the adept should have realized that his active union with the angel implies one, the death of his old mind, save insofar as his unconscious elements preserve its memory when they absorb it, and two, the death of his unconscious elements themselves. But their death is rather a going forth to renew their life through love. He then, by conscious comprehension of them, separately and together, becomes the angel of his angel, as Hermes is the word of Zeus, whose own voice is thunder. 
Thus, in this section, the adept utters inarticulately, so far as words may, what his angel is to himself. He says this with his sin leka, or shining body, or body of light, wholly withdrawn into his physical body, constraining his angel to indwell his heart. Line 1. I am he asserts the destruction of the senses of separateness between self and self. It affirms existence, but of the third person only. The bornless spirit is free of all space, having sight in the feet, that they may choose their own path. Strong is Gabur, the magician escorted by the sun and the moon. The immortal fire is the creative self. Impersonal energy cannot perish, no matter what form it assumes. Combustion is love. Line 2. Truth is the necessary relation of any two things. Therefore, although it implies duality, it enables us to conceive of two things as being one thing, such that it demands to be defined by complementals. Thus, an hyperbola is a simple idea, but its construction exacts two curves. Line 3. The angel, as the adept knows him, is a being of Tifreth, which obscures Kether. The adept is not officially aware of the higher Sephiroth. He cannot perceive, like the Epsissimus, that all things soever are equally illusion and equally absolute. He is in Tifreth, whose office is redemption, and he deplores the events which have just caused the apparent sorrow from which he has just escaped. He is also aware, even in the height of his ecstasy, of the limits and defects of his attainment. Line 4. This refers to the phenomena which accompany his attainment. Line 5. This means the recognition of the angel as the true self of his subconscious self, and hidden life of his physical life. Line 6. The adept realizes every breath, every word of his angel, as charged with creative fire. Tifereth is the sun, and the angel is the spiritual sun of the soul of the adept. Line 7. Here is summed the entire process of bringing the conditioned universe to knowledge of itself through the formula of generation. A soul implants itself in sense-hoodwinked body and reason-fettered mind, makes them aware of their inmate, and thus to partake of its own consciousness of the light. That is, Yadhe realizing themselves will and understanding in the twins Vavhe, mind and body. Line 8. Grace has here its proper sense as pleasantness. The existence of the angel is the justification of the device of creation. But see also the general solution of the riddle of existence in the Book of the Law and its commentaries. Line 9. This line must be studied in the light of Liber 65. Section H. This recapitulation demands the going forth together of the adept and his angel to do their pleasure on the earth among the living. Section J. The beast, 666, having devised the present method of using this ritual, having proved it by his practice to be of infallible puissance when properly performed, and now having written it down for the world, it shall be an ornament for the adept who adopts it to cry hail to his name at the end of his work. This shall, moreover, encourage him in magic to recall that indeed there was one who attained by its use to the knowledge and conversation of his holy guardian angel, the which forsook him no more, but made him a magus, the word of the Eon of Horus. For know this, that the name IAO in its most secret and mighty sense declareth the formula of the magic of the beast, whereby he wrought many wonders. And because he doth will that the whole world shall attain to his art, he now hideth it herein, so that the worthy may win to his wisdom. Let Yod and Vav face all, yet ward their A from attack. If we adopt the new orthography, Val, Yod, Aleph, A, and Vav, we must read the sun, six, the sun, etc. for all, and elaborate this interpretation here given in other ways accordingly. This A, N, or Vav will not be the hierophant but the devil, the I, Baphame, etc., fifteen by function instead of five, etc., and an act free, firm, aspiring, etc., rather than gentle, etc., is in the present text. The hermit to himself, the fool to foes, the arrogant to friends. Nine by nature, not by attainment, five by function. In speech swift, subtle and secret, in thought creative, unbiased, unbounded, in act gentle, patient, persistent. Hermes to hear, Dionysus to touch, Pan to behold. A virgin, a babe, and a beast. A liar, an idiot, and a master of men. A kiss, a guffaw, and a bellow. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Take ten that be one, and one that is one in three, to conceal them in six. Thy wand to all cups, and thy disc to all swords, but betray not thine egg. 
Moreover, also is IAO verily 666 by virtue of number, and this is a mystery of mysteries. Who knoweth it, he is adept of adepts, and mighty among magicians. Now this word, Sabeo, being the number three score and ten, is a name of Aen, the I, and the devil, our Lord, and the goat of Mendes. There is an alternative spelling, Zadi, Beth, Aleph, Vav, where the root and host has the value of 93. The practicus should revise this ritual throughout in the light of his personal researches in the Kabbalah. The spelling here suggested implies that he who utters the word affirms his allegiance to the symbols 93 and 6, that he is a warrior in the army of will and of the sun. 93 is also the number of Iwas and 6 of the beast. He is the Lord of the Sabbath of the Adepts and is Satan, therefore also the sun, whose number of magic is 666, the seal of his servant, the beast. But again, Sa, Samek Aleph, is 61, A-N, the number of Nuit. Ba, Beth Aleph, 3, means to go, for Hadith. And Vav is their son, the son, who is Rahur Kui. So then let the adept set his sigil upon all the words that he hath writ in the book of the works of his will. And then let him end all, saying, Such are the words. The consonants of Logos, Greek, word, add in Hebrew values to 93. And Epe, words, whence epic, has also the value. Edi ta Epe, Greek, hold the words, might be the phrase here intended. Its number is 418. This would then assert the accomplishment of the great work. This is the natural conclusion of the ritual. See Library AL, chapter 3, verse 75. For by this he maketh proclamation before all them that be about his circle that these words are true and puissant, binding what he would bind and loosing what he would loose. Let the adept perform this ritual aright, perfect in every part thereof, once daily for one moon, then twice at dawn and dusk for two moons, next thrice noon added for three moons, afterwards midnight making up his course for four moons four times every day. Then let the eleventh moon be consecrated wholly to this work. Then let the eleventh moon be consecrated wholly to this work. Let him be instant and continual ardour, dismissing all but his sheer needs to eat and sleep. For know that the true formula whose virtue sufficed the beast in this attainment was this, invoke often. So may all men come at last to the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel, thus saith the beast, and prayeth his own angel that this book be as a burning lamp, and as a living spring for light and life to them that read therein. These needs are modified during the process of initiation, both as to quantify and qualify. One should not become anxious about one's physical or mental health on a priori grounds, but pay attention only to indubitable systems of distress should such arise. The oracles of Zoroaster utter this, And when, by often invoking, all the phantasms are vanished, thou shalt see that holy and formless fire, that fire which darts and flashes through all the depths of the universe. Hear thou the voice of the fire. A similar fire flashingly extending through the rushings of air, of a fire formless whence cometh the image of a voice, or even a flashing light abounding, revolving, whirling forth, crying aloud. Also there is the vision of the fire flashing courser of light, or also a child, born aloft on the shoulders of the celestial steed, fiery, or clothed with gold, or naked, or shooting with the bow shafts of light, and standing on the shoulders of the horse. Then if thy meditation prolongeth itself, thou shalt unite all these symbols into the form of a lion. This passage, combined with several others, is paraphrased in poetry by Alistair Crowley in his Tannhauser. Point 3. Scolion on sections G and GG. The adept who has mastered this ritual, successfully realizing the full import of this controlled rapture, ought not to allow his mind to loosen its grip on the astral imagery of the star spate, will symbol or soul symbol, or even to forget its duty to the body and the sensible surroundings nor should he omit to keep his body of light in close touch with the phenomena of its own plane, so that its privy consciousness may fulfill its proper functions of protecting his scattered ideas from obsession. But he should have acquired by previous practice the faculty of detaching these elements of his consciousness from their articulate center, so that they may become temporarily independent responsible units, capable of receiving communications from headquarters at will, but perfectly able, one, to take care of themselves without troubling their chief, and two, to report to him at the proper time, 
In a figure, they must be like subordinate officers, expected to display self-reliance, initiative, and integrity in the execution of the orders of the day. The adept should therefore be able to rely on these individual minds of his to control their own conditions without interference from himself for the time required, and to recall them in due course, receiving an accurate report of their adventures. This being so, the adept will be free to concentrate his deepest self, that part of him which unconsciously orders his true will, upon the realization of his holy guardian angel. The absence of his bodily, mental, and astral consciousness is indeed cardinal to success, for it is their usurpation of his attention which has made him deaf to his soul, and his preoccupation with their affairs that has prevented him from perceiving that soul. The effect of the ritual has been, a, to keep them busy with their own work so that they cease to distract him, b, to separate them so completely that his soul is stripped of its sheaths, c, to arouse in him an enthusiasm so intense as to intoxicate and anesthetize him so that he may not feel and resent the agony of his spiritual vivisection, just as bashful lovers get drunk on the wedding night, in order to brazen out the intensity of shame which so mysteriously coexists with their desire d. To concentrate the necessary spiritual forces from every element and fling them simultaneously into the aspiration towards the holy guardian angel, and e. To attract the angel by the vibration of the magical voices which invoke him. The method of the ritual is thus manifold. There is firstly an analysis of the adept which enables him to calculate his course of action. He can decide what must be banished, what purified, what concentrated. He can then concentrate his will upon its one essential element, overcoming its resistance, which is automatic, like a physiological reflex, by destroying inhibitions through his ego-overwhelming enthusiasm. A high degree of initiation is required. This means that the process of analysis must have been carried out very thoroughly. The adept must have become aware of his deepest impulses and understood their true significance. The resistance here mentioned is automatic. It increases indefinitely against a direct pressure. It is useless to try to force oneself in these matters. The uninitiated aspirant, however eager he may be, is sure to fail. One must know how to deal with each internal idea as it arises. It is impossible to overcome one's inhibitions by conscious effort. Their existence justifies them. God is on their side, as on that of the victim in Browning's instance Tyrannus. A man cannot compel himself to love, however much he may want to, on various rational grounds. But on the other hand, when the true impulse comes, it overwhelms all its critics. They are confounded in a common oblivion. Public opinion is powerless either to make or break a genius. It can only testify to the fact that it has met its master. But the results of the ritual are too various to permit a rigid description. One may say that presuming the union to be perfect, the adept need not retain any memory soever of what has occurred. He may be merely aware of a gap in his conscious life and judge of its contents by observing that his nature has been subtly transfigured. Such an experience might indeed be proof of perfection. If the adept is to be any wise conscious of his angel, it must be that some part of his mind is prepared to realize the rapture and to express to itself in one way or another. This involves the perfection of that part, its freedom from prejudice and the limitations of rationality so called. For instance, one could not receive the illumination as to the nature of life which the doctrine of evolution should shed if one is passionately persuaded that humanity is essentially not animal or convinced that causality is repugnant to reason. The adept must be ready for the utter destruction of his point of view on any subject, and even that of his innate conception of the forms and laws of thought. Of course, even false tenets and modes of the mind are in one sense true. It is only their appearance which alters. Copernicus did not destroy the facts of nature or change the instruments of observation. He merely effected a radical simplification of science. Error is really a fool's knot. Moreover, the very tendency responsible for the entanglement is one of the necessary elements of the situation. Nothing is wrong in the end, and one cannot reach the right point of view without the aid of one's particular wrong point. If we reject or alter the negative of a photograph, we shall not get a perfect positive. Thus, he may find that his angel considers his business or his love to be absurd trifles, also that human ideas of time are invalid and human laws of logic applicable only to the relations between illusions. Now the angel will make contact with the adept at any point that is sensitive to his influence. 
Such a point will naturally be one that is salient in the adept's character, and also one that is, in the proper sense of the word, pure. This means free from ideas, however excellent in themselves, which are foreign to it. For instance, literary interest has no proper place in a picture. Thus an artist, attuned to appreciate plastic beauty, is likely to receive a visual impression of his angel in a physical form which is sublimely quintessential of his ideal. A musician may be rapt away by majestic melodies such as he never hoped to hear. A philosopher may attain apprehension of tremendous truths, the solution of problems which had baffled him all his life. Conformably with this doctrine, we read of illuminations experienced by simple-minded men, such as the workman who saw God and likened him to a quantity of little pears. Again, we know that ecstasy, impinging upon unbalanced minds, inflames the idolized idea, and produces fanatical faith fierce even to frenzy. With intolerance and insanely disordered energy, which is yet so powerful as to affect the destinies of empires. But the phenomena of the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel are a side issue. The essence of the union is the intimacy. This intimacy, or rather identity, is independent of all partial forms of expression. At its best, it is therefore as inarticulate as love is. The intensity of the consummation will more probably compel a sob or a cry, some natural physical gesture of animal sympathy with the spiritual spasm. This is to be criticized as incomplete self-control. Silence is nobler. In any case, the adept must be in communion with his angel, so that his soul is suffused with sublimity, whether intelligible or not in terms of intellect. It is evident that the stress of such a spiritual possession must tend to overwhelm the soul, especially at first. It actually suffers from the excess of its ecstasy, just as extreme love produces vertigo. The soul sinks and swoons. Such weakness is fatal alike to its enjoyment and its apprehension. Be strong, then canst thou bear more joy, saith the book of the law. Consult, moreover, Libraeal Velegis, chapter 2, verses 61 through 68, where the details of a proper technique are discussed. The adept must therefore play the man, arousing himself to harden his soul. To this end, I, the beast, have made trial and proof of diverse devices. Of these, the most potent is to set the body to strive with the soul. Let the muscles take a grip on themselves as if one were wrestling. Let the jaw and mouth in particular be tightened to the utmost. Breathe deeply, slowly, yet strongly. Keep mastery over the mind by muttering forcibly and inaudibly. But lest such muttering tend to disturb communion with the angel, speak only his name. Until the adept have heard that name, therefore, he may not abide in the perfect possession of his beloved. His most important task is thus to open his ears to the voice of his angel, that he may know him how he is called. For hearken, this name understood rightly and fully, declared the nature of the angel in every point. Wherefore also that name is the formula of the perfection to which the adept must aspire, and also of the power of magic by virtue whereof he must work. He then that is yet ignorant of that name, let him repeat a word worthy of this particular ritual. Such are Abrahadabra, the word of the Eon, which signifieth the great work accomplished, and Om, already interpreted in part three of this book, and the name of the beast, for that his number showeth forth this union with the angel, and his work is no other than to make all men partakers of this mystery of the mysteries of magic. So then, saying this word or that, let the adept wrestle with his angel and withstand him, that he may constrain him to consent to continue in communion, that he may constrain him to consent to continue in communion until the consciousness becomes capable of clear comprehension and of accurate transmission of the transcendent truth of the beloved to the heart that holds him. The normal intellect is incapable of these functions. A superior faculty must have been developed. As Zoroaster says, extend the void mind of thy soul to that intelligible, that thou mayest learn the intelligible because it subsisteth beyond mind. Thou wilt not understand it as when understanding some common thing. The firm repetition of one of these words ought to enable the adept to maintain the state of union for several minutes even at first. In any case, he must rekindle his ardour, esteeming his success rather as an encouragement to more ardent aspiration than as a triumph. He should increase his efforts. Let him beware of the lust of result, of expecting too much, of losing courage if his first success is followed by a series of failures. 
for success makes success so incredible that one is apt to create an inhibition fatal to subsequent attempts. One fears to fail. The fear intrudes upon the concentration and so fulfills its own prophecy. We know how too much pleasure in a love affair makes one afraid to disgrace oneself on the next few occasions. Indeed, until familiarity has accustomed one to the idea that one's lover has never supposed one to be more than human. Confidence returns gradually. Inarticulate ecstasy is replaced by a more sober enjoyment of the elements of the fascination. Just so, one's first dazzled delight in a new landscape turns, as one continues to gaze, to the appreciation of exquisite details of the view. At first, they were blurred by the blinding rush of general beauty. They emerge one by one as the shock subsides, and passionate rapture yields to intelligent interest. In the same way, the adept almost always begins by torrential lyrics painting out mystical extravagances about ineffable love, unimaginable bliss, inexpressible infinities of illimitable utterness. He usually loses his sense of proportion, of humor, of reality, and of sound judgment. His ego is often inflated to the bursting point, till he would be abjectly ridiculous if he were not so pitifully dangerous to himself and others. He also tends to take his newfound truths of illumination for the entire body of truth, and insists that they must be as valid and vital for all men as they happen to be for himself. It is wise to keep silence about those things unlawful to utter, which one may have heard in the seventh heaven. This may not apply to the sixth. The adept must keep himself in hand, however tempted to make a new heaven and a new earth in the next few days by trumpeting his triumphs. He must give time a chance to redress his balance sore shaken by the impact of the infinite. As he becomes adjusted to intercourse with his angel, he will find his passionate ecstasy develop a quality of peace and intelligibility which adds power, while it informs and fortifies his mental and moral qualities instead of obscuring and upsetting them. He will by now have become able to converse with his angel, impossible as it once seemed, for he now knows that the storm of sound which he supposed to be the voice was only the clamor of his own confusions. The infinity nonsense was born of his own instability to think clearly beyond his limits, just as a bushman confronted by numbers above five can only call them many. The truth told by the angel, immensely as it extends the horizon of the adept, is perfectly definite and precise. It does not deal in ambiguities and abstractions. It possesses form and confesses law in exactly the same manner and degree as any other body of truth. It is to the truth of the material and intellectual spheres of man very much what the mathematics of philosophy, with its infinite series and Cantorian continuity, is to schoolboy arithmetic. Each implies the other, though by that one may explore the essential nature of existence, and by this a pawnbroker's profits. This, then, is the true aim of the adept in this whole operation to assimilate himself to his angel by continual conscious communion, for his angel is an intelligible image of his own true will, to do which is the whole of the law of his being. Also the angel appeareth in Tifereth, which is the heart of the Ruach, and thus the center of gravity of the mind. It is also directly inspired from Kether, the ultimate self, through the path of the high priestess, or initiated intuition. Hence the angel is in truth the logos or articulate expression of the whole being of the adept, so that, as he increases in the perfect understanding of his name, he approaches the solution of the ultimate problem, who he himself truly is. Unto this final attainment the adept may trust his angel to lead him, for the Tifereth consciousness alone is connected by the paths with the various parts of his mind. None, therefore, save he that hath the knowledge requisite for calculating the combinations of conduct will organize and equilibrate the forces of the adept against the moment when it becomes necessary to confront the abyss. The adept must control a compact and coherent mass if he is to make sure of hurling it from him with a clean-cut gesture. I, the beast, 666, lift up my voice and swear that I myself have been brought hither by mine angel, and that I had attained unto the knowledge and conversation of him by virtue of mine ardour towards him, and of this ritual that I bestow upon men my fellows, and most of his great love that he beareth to me. Yea, verily, he led me to the abyss, he made me fling away all that I had and all that I was, and he forsook me in that hour. But when I came beyond the abyss, to be reborn within the womb of Babylon, then came he unto me, abiding in my virgin heart, its lord and lover. Also he made me a magus, speaking through his law the word of the new eon, the eon of the crowned and conquering child. 
Thus he fulfilled my will to bring full freedom to the race of men. Yeah, he wrought also in me a work of wonder beyond this, but in this matter I'm sworn to hold my peace. Thee I invoke, the bornless one, thee that didst create the earth and the heavens, thee that didst create the night and the day, thee that didst create the darkness and the light. Thou art Ra Hur Kuit, whom no man hath seen at any time. Thou art Ea Bez, thou art Ea Apophras. Thou hast distinguished between the just and the unjust. Thou didst make the male and the female. Thou didst produce the seed and the fruit. Thou didst form men to love one another and to hate one another. I am Mayan, thy prophet, unto whom thou didst commit thy mysteries, the ceremonies of Kem. Thou didst produce the moist and the dry, and that which nourisheth all createth life. Hear thou me, for I am the angel of Ta Apophras Ra. This is thy true name, handed down to the prophets of Kem. Hear me, Aar, Yau, Rebet, Athele Berset, E, Belatha, Abu, Ibu, Phi, Theta, So, Ib, Thea, Hear me, and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the water, of whirling air and of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. I invoke thee, the terrible and invisible God, who dwellest in the void place of the spirit. Abreo. So to Mudorio Falartheo O Epe, the bornless one. Hear me and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the water, of whirling air and of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. Hear me, Ru Abra Ayo, Mariodam, Babylon Baal bin Abaft, Asalon I, Afen Ayo, I, Boteth Abrasex, Ayu. Iscure, mighty and bornless one, hear me and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the water, of whirling air and of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. I invoke thee, Ma Barayo, Iol, Kotha. Athor Ibalo Abraft. Hear me, and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the water, of whirling air and of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. Hear me, Aft Abaft Baom. Isaac, Sabaphet, Ayo. This is the Lord of the gods. This is the Lord of the universe. This is he whom the winds fear. This is he who, having made voice by his commandment, is Lord of all things, King, Ruler, and Helper. Hear me and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the water, of whirling air and of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. Hear me, I O pure, I O pure, Eoth, Eoth, I O a 
Brassix, Sabrium, O Vav, Adonai, Ede, Edu, Angelos, Tontheon, An La La, Lai, Gaia, Epe, Diathana, Thoron. I am he, the bornless spirit, having sight in the feet, strong in the immortal fire. I am he, the truth. I am he, who hate that evil should be wrought in the world. I am he, that lighteneth and thundereth. I am he, from whom is the shower of the life of earth. I am he, whose mouth ever flameth. I am he, the begetter and manifester unto the light. I am he, the grace of the world. The heart girt with a serpent is my name. Come thou forth and follow me, and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the ether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land or in the water, of whirling air or of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God, may be obedient unto me. I O Sabe O Such are the words.